أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأذن في الناس بالحج يأتوك رجالا وعلى كل ضامر وعلى كل ضامر يأتين من كل فج عميق لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ وَيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى وَيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَّعْلُومَاتٍ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحج أشهر معلومات فمن فرض فيهن الحج فلا رفث فلا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج وما تفعلوا من خير يعلمه الله وتزودوا فإن خير الزاد التقوى واتقون يا أولي الألباب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله ما بعد I just recited for you two of the uh, verses in the Quran there are others as well but two of the primary verses that deal with the blessings of Hajj and in the first one, Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the commandment of Hajj. This is where Hajj begins. Where does it begin? Say the adhan for Hajj. There is an actual adhan that was given for Hajj. Here the adhan here means proclaim to mankind that they should come for Hajj. Where and when was this proclamation made? It was made over 4,000 years ago in the holy city of Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when the Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salam first built the Kaaba with his son Ismail when he first built the Kaaba and nobody had yet done tawaf and nobody had yet traveled and nobody had done anything for the Kaaba yet Allah said announce the Hajj wa adhin fin nasi bil Hajj and make this adhan to all of mankind wa adhin fin nasi bil Hajj make it for all of mankind and so Ibrahim alayhi salam it is said he asked Allah oh Allah this is a dead land this is an empty land oh Allah who's gonna come to perform Hajj to your sacred house when nobody lives here when this is in the middle of nowhere and Allah said to Ibrahim alayhi salam you give the adhan and I will make sure it is heard. You give the adhan and I will make sure people hear and respond to that adhan. And so our, our father Ibrahim alayhi salam, he walked to the surrounding valleys. He walked to, uh, uh, he walked to the uh, mountains around and to Safa and Marwa as well and to the other mountains, Jabal Qubais and others he went. And from every mountain top, he announced that, Ayyuhan nas, O people, O mankind, Allah has asked me to proclaim that you should come to Hajj. You should come to his house to perform the Hajj. And when he gave that call, no human being other than his family heard. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept that call alive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept that adhan perpetual. And so since that year, every single year, even pre-Islam, and with the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Islam, and up until our time post-Islam, throughout all of these 4,000 years, people have been performing hajj. And that adhan has become so popular that the largest annual gathering in the whole world this is according to the guinness book of world records the largest religious gathering every single year is the hajj and that is the response to that adhan and in fact when we say labbaik allahumma labbaik and you should know this this is a very key point here when we say labbaik we are responding to that call that adhan that's what labbaik means literally labbaik means 
Oh Allah, here I am at your service. Oh Allah, I'm responding to your call. Labaik is a term in Arabic that doesn't have an English equivalent. There's no simple word here. And labba means to respond to a call. That's literally what it means. So you only do labaik when somebody has called you. You don't, you don't just come and say, hey, I'm here. That's not labaik. Labaik is somebody calls you, says, has come here. When you respond to the call in Arabic, you say, Labaika, I am responding to your call. Now, a lot of us say, Labaika, Allahumma Labaik, and we don't understand why we're saying it. You know why we're saying it? We are responding to the adhan that our father Ibrahim gave. And that's literally what we say, Labaik, Allahumma Labaik. Oh Allah, I heard the adhan. I heard the call. I believe in that call. I know you have called me to your house. You told me to come, Labaika. I have responded to that call. I have replied to that call. Here I am, O oh Allah, responding to the, <coughs> to the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam and replying to your commandment to come. So that is why we are coming to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And O oh Muslim, what can impress us? What can make us understand the reality of this sacred journey that you are all about to undertake. SubhanAllah, I have performed more hajjs than I can remember, I think almost 20 hajjs. And every single time we go over and I go over these ayat and hadith, it is just humbling. It is just overpowering the blessings of hajj. Never you lose the, the hope and the enthusiasm and the awe of the blessings given. Do you know, O oh Muslim, that the famous companion Amr ibn al-As, uh, that he had a, a stellar resume and a, a very well-known career pre-Islam and he had committed some crimes against the Muslims because he was a general, because he had done things, you know, militarily. That Amr ibn al-As was the last Muslim to convert uh, before the conquest of Mecca. He was the last Muslim to make hijrah. And when he came to Medina, the last Muslim to migrate to Medina, literally the last Muslim, and he was very embarrassed at all that he had done. He had literally, you know, harmed the ummah, even killed Muslims in the pre-Islamic days of Jahiliyyah, you know, when he was fighting on the wrong side. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he put his hand out and the Prophet ﷺ was going to take it. Then he put his hand back. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what's up? Why are you putting, you, you came to accept Islam, right? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a condition. Now, this was in the uh, seventh year of the Hijrah. This was before the conquest of Mecca. No Hajj had been performed yet. The Muslims had not done Hajj yet. Listen to this Hadith. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, Mahyam, what's up? Why did you put your hand back? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a condition. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what's the condition? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I've done so much wrong. I, I, I want to embrace Islam on a clean slate. I want all my sins to be forgiven. I don't want to have to deal with all that I've done. So the Prophet ﷺ smiled. Remember, it's the seventh year. Nobody has done Hajj yet. And yet he's giving this Hadith. He said, he said, O oh, Amr, don't you know that a non-Muslim embracing Islam and a Muslim performing Hajj. Notice, wallahi, this hadith is mind-boggling. Look at the context. There has never been a Hajj done. Yet the Prophet wanted us to know the equivalent. Don't you know, O Amr, that when a person embraces Islam, or when a Muslim does Hajj, and it is accepted, then all of their previous sins are forgiven. All of the sins are forgiven. Subhanallah, our Prophet وسلم, equated the going for Hajj he equated the performance of the Hajj as a Muslim with literally the embracing of Islam as a non-Muslim. That's literally the equation. O oh Muslim, whom Allah has chosen to go for Hajj, listen to me and listen carefully. And I'm, I'm being very, very frank over here. If you are going for Hajj, if your niyyah to go for Hajj is just to cross off something on your to-do list, if it is just to, in your mind, get rid of some, you know, deep-seated, you know, obligation you think you have, and that's it to go back to resume your normal life afterwards, then I warn you, I caution you that you are not performing Hajj with the right frame of mind. This is not how you perform Hajj to cross it off your to-do list. It is not a chore that you just have to get rid of and then return. A'udhu Billah. No. Hajj is literally a transformative experience. It is a life-changing experience. What 
changes occur when a non-Muslim embraces Islam? What sacrifices does that person have to do? What new routines and rituals does a non-Muslim have to take on? You and I both know it is literally a game changer, a life-changing experience. Well, guess what, O Muslim? You and I performing the Hajj, that is the equivalent of a non-Muslim embracing Islam. That is a life-changing transformation that should affect a complete overhaul, a complete redual of your priorities, of your ethics, of your livelihood, of your routine. Everything should change. That's the goal of Hajj. And if and when you go with that mindset, well then, that is a whole different experience. And that is when Hajj will indeed have all of these blessings that we are talking about. But dear Muslim, and I tell you from now, if you go with the wrong intention, if you go without having this mindset that I want Allah to accept my Hajj and I want Hajj to be something that truly impacts me. If you don't go with this mindset, well then there's still time inshaAllah ta'ala rethink through and have a genuine sincere commitment that oh Allah you are allowing me to come and realize oh Muslim that the very fact that you get for Hajj, the very fact you're allowed to go for Hajj in and of itself, this is a blessing and a choosing that is not in my hand. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Hujjaju wafdullahi ta'ala, Al-Hujjaju wafdullahi ta'ala, da'ahum fa'ajabu. The Hujjaj are Allah's delegations and guests. Allah's delegations and guests. Allah invited them and they accepted that invitation. So to be there in Mecca, to be there in Hajj, this is not something that is in your choice or my choice. It is in the choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the very fact you have been chosen, the very fact that Allah azza wa has given you this opportunity means He wants you to change and He wants you to become somebody that is beloved to Him and He wants to forgive your sins. So accept that invitation, accept that blessing that Allah has given you and make sure you have the right mindset make sure your niya your paradigm your entire tasawwur your entire uh, 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 methodology of going for hajj that you think about it from here and now there's barely two months left oh muslim so now is the time you have to start thinking why am i going what is my goal when i come back what will i be doing to manifest the blessings of allah for having gone for hajj our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said afdalul a'mal the best of all deeds is Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Hajj then it is the Hajj Hajj is the greatest thing you can do after Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our mother Aisha radiallahu anha she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she said Ya Rasulullah all the men are getting their rewards they go for you the battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud the battle of Khandaq the battle of, uh, of Muraisi all of these battles what can we do we can't go in these battles. We want to get all of the blessings of jihad and of shahad and everything possible. We want those blessings. The Prophet wasallam said, I will tell you of the equivalent of jihad that has no hardship uh, of blood. There's no blood being shed in it, but he'll get the rewards. And that is the jihad of going for hajj and umrah simply doing hajj and umrah traveling for hajj and umrah participating in hajj and umrah all of the blessings that the true people of jihad and of badr and 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 and, and uhud and all of those uh, uh, expeditions that that will come to the one that is undertaking the hajj to the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, three people, thalathun fi dhimanillahi ta'ala, three people are under the protection of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah has promised that they will be blessed by protection here. It doesn't mean no harm will come to them. Protection here means that Allah has given them special attention, special care. Three are the people that Allah Azza wa has protected fi dhimanillahi ta'ala. And he said, one of them, rajulun kharaja hajjan, a person who came out and did hajj, as long as he is in Hajj, he is Allah's guest and Allah has protected him. And that's why, by the way, if a person dies in the state of Hajj, if a person dies in the state of Ihram, there's special rituals that, that the, the type of perfume and whatnot is not done upon this person because they are honored in a special manner that other people are not honored because they are Allah's guests, Allah's delegates. So, O oh, oh Muslim, Allah has chosen you to be his guest. Allah has chosen you to be his delegate. delegate. So from now, from now, my advice to myself and all of you is to get the right mindset to understand this is not something that is just crossing off the list it must be it should be a life 
transformative experience. Your goal should be that Hajj changes your heart and soul. Hajj causes you to reconnect with your faith in a manner that you have never been connected before. Hajj brings you closer to Allah than you have ever been in your entire life. That is the goal. And if that happens, then inshaAllah ta'ala, Hajj will genuinely be a transformative experience. Realize, O oh Muslims, the blessings of Hajj began even before the journey and during the journey. The blessings of Hajj began as soon as you leave your house. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that no person takes one footstep, nor does an animal take one, even one step from the animal, except that, for, going for Hajj obviously, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes an entire level of Jannah, an entire Daraja for him to be given, and an, an entire set of, of evil deeds to be wiped out. Every single footstep that you take, every single uh, portion of the journey that you do, and, and many of us are going from faraway lands. Imagine we are going all the way from America. And so every single step that you do, and every single journey that you travel, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to give different levels of Jannah and forgive different quantities of sins simply by your undertaking the journey for Hajj. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that nobody says the talbiyah, nobody says the takbir in the Hajj, nobody says that la ilaha illallah while they're going for Hajj, except that an angel is going to be giving him glad tidings of Jannah. An angel will be giving him glad tidings of, of, of Jannah. And whatever talbiyah that we do, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, every time that we do the talbiyah, whatever hears the talbiyah around us will testify on the day of judgment. Every rock, every leaf, every every stone, every brick of the building, even inanimate objects, they will testify that, oh Allah, this person answered your call. Oh Allah, this person left his house or her house and walked or rode the bus or took the train or took the airplane and, and traveled all the way from his home in order to please you and to sacrifice of his wealth and time to answer the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And every single footstep that we take is going to be blessed. And as for the blessings of Arafat, as for the blessings of the people of Arafat, then what will make you realize the blessings of the people of Arafat? What will make you realize the blessings of the people of Arafat? There is no gathering more sacred than the gathering of Arafat. There is no blessed people more blessed in our times after the Sahaba, obviously. There is no blessed groups of people that is more blessed than the gathering of the plains of Arafat. Allah Azza wa Jal Himself boasts to the angels of how proud he is of those people. Allah himself boasts to the people that look at all of my servants. They have gathered from all over the world. Look at how tired they are. This is all in the hadith. Look at how tired they are. Look at how dusty they are. Look at how disheveled they are. You know, you're in ihram for three days, right? You will, you will realize, if you haven't been, you will realize exactly this hadith. O oh, Muslim, memorize this hadith and console yourself because you will feel tired. You will feel dirty. You will feel disheveled. That because of the circumstances, it's going to be difficult to take baths and showers. Because of the circumstances, you're going to be sweaty and grimy. Because of the circumstances, you wouldn't have combed your hair, your deodorants, your perfumes, all gone. And so you are literally dusty and tired and disheveled and when you are feeling that way don't feel down don't feel don't feel depressed thank Allah that you're there and remember this hadith that Allah Azza wa Jal hadith Qudsi Allah Azza wa Jal will boast to the angels look at my servants ila ha'ula. look at these servants they have come from all over the world responding to my call and they are dusty tired disheveled they are they are as they are and they are all gathered for one reason and that is they want my forgiveness and then he Allah Azza wa Jal will say to the angels that I call you to testify that I have forgiven every single one of them I have forgiven down to the last person and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in an authentic hadith he said du'a'i du'a'u Arafa. the best dua anybody can ever make is the dua of Arafa. the best dua anybody can make is the dua of Arafa. oh Muslim no dua of yours in your whole life no dua is more powerful and more effective than the du'as you can make 
on the day of Arafah, in the plains of Arafah. You will have the opportunity to speak directly with Allah. You will have the opportunity to hand in your petitions directly to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be listening to the pleas of every single one of you, to the requests of every single one of you. So go prepared. Make sure you know the du'as that you want. And the most important du'a is the du'a of maghfirah and hidayah. You want Allah to forgive your past. You want Allah to bless your future with guidance. You want Allah to forgive all the sins you've done. You want Allah to make it easy for you to be the best Muslim you can be in the future. Make these du'as a priority and know that the du'a of, the du'a of Arafah is a du'a that is accepted by Allah. No du'a is turned away on the day of Arafah. Every single du'a that you make is going to be accepted. Now of course to be accepted means that Allah Azza wa Jal will hear and give you something. Something what you wanted or something better than that. So an equivalent or better than that. So every dua you make will be accepted. And when you finish Arafat and you go over to the land of Muzdalifah, there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Muzdalifah in the Quran. فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُ اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَلِ الْحَرَامِ Mash'al al-Haram, Allah, that's where Muzdalifah is, the sacred uh, lands and territory. Allah mentions Muzdalifah in the Quran. And he says, once you finish up Arafat, then go and continue your dhikr in Mash'al al-Haram. Continue in Muzdalifa. And then from Muzdalifa, when you work your way, walk your way to the Jamarat, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَأَمَّا رَمْيُكَ لِلْجِمَارِ And as for your stoning that you do for the Jamarat, then Allah will safeguard every single blessing of that day. You're walking and you're pelting. فَإِنَّهَا مَذْخُورُ لَكَ It will be invested for you, is a saying, you can translate it. All the deeds of that day, because that is a hectic, the, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah is always hectic, because there's so much to do, right? You have to walk, you have to go pelt, you have to go to change and everything. Always the most hectic day, right, of the 10th. So, uh, so the Prophet ﷺ said, that day and the day of Jamarat that you do it, all of it, Allah will invest it for you. Allah will store it for you. Meaning, you're going to see all that you've done on the day of judgment. You will get it back and it will please you and you will be happy of all that you have done. And then as for the shaving of a hair, our Prophet Sallallahu said that when your hair is shaved or trimmed, for every hair that falls, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will, forg will forgive your evil. Allah will forgive all of your evil deeds. So it is symbolic and it is real that as you are shaving or trimming, then all of this is falling off, so too your sins are completely falling off. And then when you do your tawaf al-ifada, and that is of course the, 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 the main uh, rukun after the rukun of, of, uh, of, of standing in, Muzda in, in, in Arafat, when you do your tawaf al-ifada, which is done uh, on the 10th or 11th or 12th, whenever you do it, whenever you do your tawaf al-ifada, realize that is one of the primary pillars of hajj. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when the hajj, when the hajj does his tawaf and he finishes, then he will leave the, the Kaaba as pure as the day his mother gave birth to him. You know the famous hadith that we have about uh, having all your sins forgiven? It applies right at the point of tawaf al-ifada. When you finish tawaf al-ifada, then expect Allah Azza wa Jal to bless you with a complete clean slate and you are now spiritually absolutely pure even though physically you're sweating and physically you're tired and physically your clothes are dirty and physically you might hear this and that but spiritually you are sparkling clean you have never been cleaner in your whole life then that day as an adult, yes, you were clean, as clean that day when you were born because you have no sin. But since that day, now is the cleanest day you have ever been. So as you do tawaf al-ifada, as you do your ifada, understand the spiritual significance of that of tawaf. Do not trivialize that day and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have your hajj accepted. O Muslim, realize as our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that wal hajjul mabrur laysa lahu jaza'un illa al-jannah. The hajj that is accepted accepted it has no reward lesser than jannah itself you see there is no grade for hajj you don't get a b plus for hajj you don't get a c plus you don't even get an a minus there is no grade for hajj you can't do a mediocre hajj you either have an accepted hajj or you don't and if you have an accepted hajj laysa lahu jazaun illa al jannah the only reward for hajj is jannah itself now do you understand why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam equated the embracing of islam by a non muslim with a muslim doing the hajj because just like the non muslim saves himself or herself from jahannam and guarantees jannah when they say the, the shahada 
so too the Muslim, when the Muslim goes for Hajj, when the Muslim participates in the rituals of Hajj, there is no reward lesser than Jannah itself. So either you do it and Allah accepts, in which case you get to Jannah. Or, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, we don't do it. We don't do it because the only reason the Hajj will not be accepted is if we did it with the wrong intention. The other, you know, technicalities we can always make up. But the only reason that the Hajj will not be accepted was something inside of us, that something we did wrong, that our niyyah was wrong, we messed up uh, uh, spiritually. That's what's going to ruin our Hajj. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, realize that the journey of Hajj it is a microcosmic journey of the spiritual soul to the Akhirah. Literally, as you are going to the Akhirah spiritually, the Hajj is like a, a physical manifestation of that. So just like the soul will journey back to Allah, in Hajj, the body journeys to the house of Allah. In the Akhirah, the soul goes back to Allah, but in this dunya, we are voluntarily walking and going to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't forget your spiritual journey as you are going physically to Mecca, physically to the house of Allah. Now, when you come back, your heart and your soul must walk on the Sirat al Mustaqim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you go for Hajj, you prepare yourself with money, you prepare yourself with medicines, you prepare yourself with taking the packages that are, you know, uh, uh, the packages you want to go with. You, pre you prepare yourself by reading uh, about Hajj and listening to lectures about Hajj. So too, Prepare, and this is, by the way, all of this is in the Quran. وتزودوا. Allah says, prepare for the journey. Don't just leave your house and expect, you know, rain to fall on you that are along the way. وتزودوا. Pack your bags, have your money, have your passport. That's literally what tazawadu means. Be, take preparations for the journey. And as you take preparations, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ زَادِ التَّقْوَى The best way to prepare yourself for this world is taqwa. That's your real Zad, that's your real provisions that you need to take. So when you prepare yourself physically for Hajj, prepare yourself spiritually to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Realize as well, when you go for Hajj, you are leaving your family and friends. You are leaving your work. You're leaving your house. And remember, a time will come when you will permanently leave all of these things to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you say goodbye to your family, you say goodbye to your friends, as you walk away from your house voluntarily, a time will come when you will walk away spiritually, involuntarily. The angel of death will come and there will be no goodbyes, but the same uh, uh, separation will take place. But the difference is that for Hajj it is temporary and for the Akhirah it is permanent. As you get into the Ihram, you will take a ghusl and shower and you will wear the Ihram. Realize what is this if not a reminder of death? What is this except exactly a reminder that at least now you are taking the shower. A time will come when ghusl will be given to you. Now you are wearing the shrouds, uh, the ihram. A time will come when the shrouds will be placed on you. Now you are taking your clothes off voluntarily and putting the ihram on. A time will come when others will take your clothes off and shroud you in your kafan of the akhirah. So as you put all of this Prepare yourself for that journey as well. That's the whole point of Hajj here, to put yourself in the spirit and mind of the journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as you go for Hajj and you see the uh, extremes, you see the chaos, you see the crowds, you see you know all that is going on, well then think of the Day of Judgment. Think of the Akhirah because what you see in Hajj is but a fraction, but a minuscule fraction of the chaos and panic and the rush that is going to be taking place in the Akhirah on the Day of Judgment. O oh Muslim, the Hajj isn't just a physical journey. It is a spiritual journey. It is a transformative journey. It is a journey that is intended to completely change and restructure your life. That is the goal of Hajj. Make it your goal from now. That is the ultimate goal. And if you make it your goal, and if you genuinely go with that intention, then insha'Allah ta'ala, your hajj is a hajj mabrur. What does hajj mabrur mean? Hajj mabrur means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with it. That Allah azza wa jal has accepted it. You want your hajj to be hajjan mabruran. You want Allah azza wa jal to have accepted your hajj. And so, O Muslim, some very quick generic advice, and then I'll open the floor for some Q&A. Uh, and today is not really the day for, for fiqh Q&A. We'll have another uh, multiple sessions, and you know, uh, each specific group 
is going to have you know more uh, classes and talks those are with my group then we have obviously our own intensive uh, series of lectures we're going to be doing and other groups can have their uh, I'm sure they have their own, own plans and packages as well and so uh, this is not really about the fiqh of Q&A but I do want to give you some uh, aspects or some uh, um, realities uh, and especially for those that have not gone for Hajj and this is your uh, first time going for Hajj then let me explain to you that uh, I'm going to tell you something that is not politically correct to say but it is needs to be said many of us who have never been for Hajj you think that you're going to be spiritually at an all-time high and you think you're going to be in this nice little bubble of Iman and Taqwa but when you get there there's going to be a million and one problems, starting with the traffic and the jostling and shoving of people, right? And the filth around you everywhere and the beggars coming to you and this and that. And you are a human being and surrounded by all that you are. And you're going to see things you don't like to see. People are being very nasty and mean in Hajj. They're pushing people in front of the Kaaba and it's really heartbreaking, right? And they're trying to do this and that. And you're like, Akhi, are you here for Hajj or what? I don't understand. So realize, O oh Muslim, you're not going to have this calm, serene bubble that you think you will. You're going to be tired. 80, 90, 99% of people fall sick during Hajj. That is the reality of Hajj because you are, you know, congregated together. You might have a slight fever, coughing. You know, this is the reality. The Hajj gift, we call it, is going for Hajj all the time. I have been for Hajj more times than I can remember. And every single time I get to the coughing virus and whatnot, it is the part of Hajj. The voice goes and whatnot. It is what happens during Hajj. So in that state, and you're going to be like, how can I find spirituality? How can I get that, 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 that high that I wanted? And I'm telling you from now, that's the spiritual high. In that chaos, with your body tired, surrounded by that filth and that dirtiness and that smells and the this and that, in that difficult situation for you to muster spirituality. It's not the way you're going to imagine it. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. It's not going to be the way you're thinking about it. But whatever you do at that stage, that is what is required. The fact that you're attempting in that complete chaos to find your personal safety, safe space, your personal spirituality, that is where your salvation will occur. So understand this point as well. And of course, and this is something again, I've already hinted at this, do realize that Hajj brings out the best and the worst of the people around. And it is the reality of the Ummah. The Ummah is not angelic. We know this. Look at what is happening around the world and what the Ummah is doing. So the Ummah is not angelic. It's not full of angels. The Ummah is full of good people and the opposite. And in Hajj, you will find the best of the best. People will sacrifice. People will, you will find people that would have walked from halfway across the world to come to Mecca and Medina. And here we are traveling in air-conditioned planes at 600 miles an hour, you know, within millisecond or within hours from one end of the world to other. There are people that have spent their life savings and they are walking. They're on bicycles. You will see this. They've come all the way from the furthest, you know, uh, countries in the world. And now they're doing Hajj and they're smiling and so happy just to be there. And your Iman is going to be all-time high. And then the very next second, you're going to see a person getting irritated, pushing somebody, you know, uh, not being uh, nice to somebody and it's going to hurt you immensely and this is the reality of Hajj and realize your job and my job is to control our temper is to control our uh, 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 tongue and our uh, anger our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said whoever does Hajj without being vulgar and without, you know, uh, uh, doing any fisk to other people, harming and, and hurting other people. He's not vulgar and he's not pushing and shoving and being nasty to people. That is the one who will go back with all of his deeds, uh, uh, with all of his sins forgiven. Why did the Prophet say he's not vulgar and he doesn't hurt other people? Because in Hajj, so many people can't help it. They lose their temper. And when they lose their temper, and believe me, and I, as I said, every hajj I've done, you see this happening in front of you and you think to yourself, subhanAllah, didn't you listen to the lecture? Didn't you listen to what the Prophet said? Didn't, weren't you warned not to do this? You're going to get angry at everybody next to you. Akhi, why are you snoring? Akhi, this, uh, this, that, ah, on and on. And you realize this is the, the test of hajj. The fact that you're congregating with two million people, you don't think issues are going to happen. You don't think there's going to be problems and stuff that are going to happen. Control your tongue, control your anger. And if you're, ang if you're angry, expect Allah to reward you for your anger. 
Don't waste your hajj by getting angry at somebody else. Don't cause your hajj to be obliterated because there are things beyond your control. Things are going to happen you don't like and I don't like. And you can't, you know, it's easy to blame everybody else. In the end of the day, there's only so much people can do. You control your anger and control your tongue. And that will be protection of your hajj. Also, one other generic advice. And again, this is my advice to you as somebody who's, as I said, done, done plenty of hajjas and I've, I've been with hajj packages so many times and uh, uh, I've seen this over and over again. So my generic advice to all of you when it comes to uh, the fiqh of hajj and the fatawa of hajj is follow from now the scholar or scholars whom you want and don't worry about the differences of opinion. Because hajj, like all fiqh issues, you have differences. Can you do this? Can you do that? And hajj is not the time to become a self-styled expert. Hajj is not the time to become your own mufti and go fatwa shopping. You need to decide which sheikh you want to follow. And whichever sheikh you follow that has studied and is whichever one is all good. No problem. And here's another point. I hope, inshallah, this is not taken in the wrong way. O oh Muslim, I am very troubled personally by how so many hujjaj become obsessed with the minutia of hajj. They become obsessed with the fine print. You know, the number one questions we get asked are about mahdurat al-ihram, about the things that bake the ihram. Oh, I, I plucked a hair. Oh, I did a nail here. Oh, I used perfume soup. So, so, etc. etc. Oh, I ate biryani that had saffron in it. And the saffron smells. So the biryani is now smelling my... Ya akhi, subhanallah. I'm not trying to make fun of that attitude. May Allah bless you with that attitude. I am going to say something blunt here. You know that enthusiasm and zeal you have for all the minutia? Cut it to 10%. Take that 90% and put it to the broader goals of Hajj. I wish people were more concerned about the spirituality of Hajj as much as they are about the very minute ahkam and details. How many times people are going to come to me? I'm not even exaggerating. It's, it sounds funny. It's so true. Showing me their shoes. I'm not joking. Wallahi, every sheikh knows this. Sheikh, is this shoe allowed or not? They're going to come and display their shoe to me and whatnot. Okay, alhamdulillah, good may Allah bless you. But you know that concern you have, wallahi, whichever thing you do, you'll find some. It's not the main issue. A thousand times, a hundred thousand times more important than the shoe that you wear. How is your qalb? How is your spiritual attitude of hajj? So please, for the love of God, don't become obsessed with the minutia. Allah is not going to punish you if you followed one scholar over another about the shoe that you wore, the sock or whatnot. This is not what Hajj is about. Yes, you need to study. And yes, you follow the ahkam to the best. I'm not you know, telling you not to not follow. I am saying prioritize the bigger goal. Don't lose the forest for the trees. Prioritize your reason for being there. And that is, you want a cleansing experience. You want to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Far more important than the ihram and this and that is the dua and the dhikr you're making from the qalb. That's a million times more important than, you know, making sure that, oh, the button is this and that. No, keep that, yani, as I said, 10%. I'm not saying throw it out the window. 10%, right? And the main thing, the main thing that you should be aware of, there's four arkan of hajj. As long as these arkan are done, you're going to go over it in the fiqh of hajj. As long as these arkan are done, and that is you declare the niya for hajj, that's called ihram. And that is that you stand at Arafat, and that you do the tawaf al fada and the sa'i. Okay, these are the four arkan. As, as long as you do this, the rest is salvageable. You can do something to make it up. As as you can do the crash course of hajj in 20 minutes, that's it. Now, the rest of the time should not be spent in the minutia, in the hair splitting, in going to the, uh, the, the, the footnotes. That's not what Hajj is about. No, the rest of the time should literally be spent. What du'as am I going to be making? How is my spiritual state here? The dhikr that I'm doing here. Am I truly connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's the spirit of Hajj. And then to start thinking from now, my life when I return from Hajj must be different. 
I must be a better person. From now, you start thinking like this. And if you do this, well then, the trivial stuff will make its way there, no problem. And the actual hajj will be accepted, inshallah ta'ala, by Allah Jalla Jalalu. So this is in a nutshell, um, uh, some of the stuff that I wanted to share. And be thankful to Allah that you have been chosen. Uh, be appreciative of the blessings. There are so many people that are not able to go less than, uh, what is it, 0.1% of the ummah is able to go for hajj. So subhanAllah, you are now in that 0.1%. You are now in the elite, the creme de la creme. You are the highest now that, that Allah has chosen. So once you get there, appreciate those blessings. Don't trivialize those blessings. Take advantage of those days and nights. Fill them with ibadah. Fill them with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not waste your hajj with vain talk, with making people angry and irritated. Control your tempers, all Muslims. I'm telling you from now, Hajj will test your temper in ways that has never been tested. You will get angry at the person next. You're going to get angry at the bus driver. You're going to get angry at me for whatever reason. I don't even know. You're going to get angry at the world, whatever. It is what it is. We can't control everything. You're going to get angry at Daru Salaam for sure, without a doubt. That's the reality. And Ahmed knows this, right? There's only so much they can do in the end of the day. This is three million people there. There's, they're trying to, they're the rest and whatnot. So, Whatever you want to do, just control your tongue. Don't lose your hajj for trivial matters. Allah blessed you to go. Allah blessed you to be there. Okay, you might not have gotten the AC you wanted. You might not have gotten the particular bed that you wanted. You know what? People are sleeping on the streets. Wallahi, this needs to be said. People have walked to hajj and they don't have a fraction of the luxuries we do. And they're thankful to Allah for that. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, if you don't get your stuff that, you know, you, you know you, it's your haq as well. We understand this. But at the same time, there's a time and a place. And I'm telling you as the religious guide, I'm telling you as the person, you know, from the spiritual side during the days of hajj is not the day to argue business during the days of hajj is not the day to lose it by showing your frustration and anger now is the time for sakina for ibadah for dhikr for rituals and to control you know your anger and tongue don't hurt other people don't harm other people allah knows you know hajj is not the time you're going to kiss the black stone honestly it's not the time get it out of your mind it's not even the wisest thing to do another time go when there's less rush there to to hurt people and do that and, and get there this is not what the sharia is is about if Allah allows it without you hurting other people alhamdulillah otherwise don't worry about this don't the time for hajj primarily as we said is the spiritual journey to Allah and to be in these holy places in Muzdalifa in Arafat in particular right in Mina these are the main requirements when you are there you are worshiping you're doing dhikr you're reading the Quran you're turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're contemplating the blessings Allah has given you you're contemplating your life up until that point in time and how your life is going to be better henceforth from that point in time that is the main point of Hajj internal and not the external stuff and not the minutia of this and that no this is all trivial the main point your soul is going to be reborn you're going to be given a second chance at life spiritually you're going to be coming back a new person so that is what hajj is about take advantage of that we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us to have a hajj mabrur we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this hajj a blessed hajj we ask allah azza wa to make it a hajj that is easy for us we don't want difficulties in our lives so we want an easy hajj we want a hajj that allows us to reconnect with him that allows us to have our sins forgiven we want to return back to our home safe and sound and as pure as the day our mothers gave birth to us and with that inshallah ta'ala i'll open the floor for uh q a from your side uh and so inshallah where do i get the questions from oh the q a tab sorry okay yes and then i think you can sort by upvotes and we can take a couple of questions inshallah for the next 11 minutes or so may allah bless okay. you Shaykh. for the session okay inshallah so let's take some questions here from now uh, how do you deal with keeping up your spiritual momentum after big events like Hajj Ramadan? I always feel super motivated during these times, but struggle with post-event blues. Any advice? Brother Azam, are you from Tennessee with your post-event blues? I was living in Tennessee for 10 years. So um, the answer to this question is the struggle for spirituality. There is no easy answer. And in attempting to find spirituality, in trying your best to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that is your salvation. As I explained to you even during Hajj, that you're not going to find the peace and quiet that you have right now 
Wallahi, right now, right after this lecture, if you sit down for five minutes, the type of spirituality you're going to be feeling, you will not experience it during Hajj. You're going to experience different types. Because in Hajj, like I said, your stomach's going to be growling. You might have had, astaghfirullah, stomach issues as well, right? And then you have fever and coughing and sneezing and everybody's crowded and it's just damp or hot or hot or cold or whatever. And there's coughing and there's smoke and there's this and that. How can you find the spirituality you're going to find in your own home right now for the next five minutes? That's not going to happen. But in that environment, for you to attempt to push the boundaries, and to raise your hand to Allah and to carve out your own spirituality. It's not going to be like today's. It's not going to be like in, in Ramadan. It's not going to be like in the peace of your masjid. It's going to be a different type. And that type is what Allah will bless. So understand, have your expectations realistic. And understand, spirituality is never just achieved once and that's it. It is constantly strive for. You constantly want to push it more and keep it strong. And there are, of course, mechanisms and ways to, to do this. And of them, most importantly, is the niyyah. When you try, you're going to get it. And of them is you immerse yourself in rituals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constant dhikr and Quran during hajj is comes with the territory. That's what you do during hajj. Hajj is about uh, dhikr. This is literally in the Quran. Literally Allah says, do dhikr in those days. That's what you're supposed to do. So, adhkar here doesn't just mean subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah akbar. Dhikr is also the Quran. Dhikr is also dua, right? Dhikr is also contemplating over life. All of this is dhikr. So, all of these are uh, things that you can do. Uh, next question, uh, Sister Nodin. Uh, does a, a woman have to make up any miss fast before going for Hajj? She should, but it is not a requirement. She should simply because it is good to get rid of all your debts before going for Hajj, but it is it has nothing to do with the validity of Hajj. So if you're not able to do that, for example, if a sister has multiple years, you know, she was pregnant, she was breastfeeding, she was pregnant, she was breastfeeding, she has plenty of uh, Ramadans to make up, she cannot do it in two months, no problem. It is not a requirement that you make up your fast before you go for Hajj, but it is good to do so if you're able to do so just because of the generic um, uh, reality of having uh, all of your debts paid if you can. And again, this is not even a requirement because even if you have a debt to somebody who allows you to go for Hajj, that too is allowed. Uh, no problem, inshallah ta'ala. Um, question here, does every accepted Hajj clean the slate of sins or only the first hajj of a muslim every single hajj brother khuram why do you think i'm doing hajj every single year that i can do and all of us that are doing it we want every single year it will cleanse you it's a cleansing experience every single year so definitely uh, uh, uh every single year uh question here i'm trying to find the highest question um my skin my question is can men wear fragrance free sunscreen on the exposed sin yes they can no problem inshallah you can wear fragrance-free anything. No problem, inshallah ta'ala. And like I said, so many of the questions will be about this. No problem. Just ask a few of them and, and don't get too much bogged down in detail. As I said, the bulk of questions comes over shoes <laughs> and then over lotions. These are the two bulk questions, okay? That's what every sheikh, like we are shown this, we're, smell, smell this, sheikh, smell this. Is this halal? <laughs> Allah musta'an. All Muslims, don't sweat the small stuff, pun intended. Don't sweat over these petty issues, okay? Use whatever soap is available and try your best to find perfume-free soap. But soap in and of itself is not perfume. Perfume is perfume. Do not take your cologne and put it on you. And even if you do it accidentally, again, the sharia is so easy. Please take a mini course on the fiqh of hajj so you know. And once you've done it, khalas, no need to ask a million questions. Really, wallahi, hajj is not meant for the minutia, as I said. Know your stuff, know what is haram and halal, and then yani, uh, don't worry about, as I said, these, these petty things. It's not going to make or break your, your, your hajj. Um, uh, is it mandatory for a man to shave or is trimming sufficient? Shaving is more blessed, but trimming is sufficient. Shaving is more rewarding by Allah. Uh, and the reason is to show humility. So the whole purpose, and again, O oh men, we know how we feel, like we want to have you know, that nice hair and whatnot. And so by shaving, you are literally sacrificing your ego. You are literally like, khalat, I want to show my humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So I do encourage, but if not, and I've done hajj so many times, sometimes I, on a personal level, sometimes I shave, sometimes I don't. It's just, it is what it is. Uh, it just um, uh, depends on my own mood at the time, no problem. But with, technically speaking, the fiqh perspective, the spiritual perspective, and especially if it's your first hajj, then uh, I would strongly encourage you to, to shave it uh, off for the men. Of course, the women, they just take the, uh, the end of the, the tip of the hair there. Um, 
uh, for the 11, 13 days of the visit, we'll be performing namaz qasr uh, qasr prayer. So when you pray behind imams, uh, you will pray with them full. When you pray on your own, you may pray for four rak'at, two rak'at, no problem. When you pray on your own, because you are a traveler throughout that entire time. Uh, but when you are behind an imam, then you will uh, uh, be praying the full, because the imam is going to be local. Uh, if the imam is not local, and the imam prays too, then you pray too as well. Uh, could you explain the spiritual significance of wills for families? So, you know, a lot of fiqh books, they mention that before you go for hajj, you have to write a will. You have to understand the reality of this is nothing to do with hajj. It's to do with past times. Because once upon a time, traveling was life-threatening, especially months of travel. And so a good percentage of people would not return. And so the advice that you give to somebody about to die, that's the advice that will be given to the people going for Hajj. In our times, going for Hajj is, has nothing to do with wills per se, but you should always have a will ready. That's the point here. You should have a will uh, in case anything happens. And so going for Hajj, it should just remind you that I should have a will as well. In and of itself, writing a will and going for Hajj are two separate obligations. So they're not causally connected with uh, one another. Uh, question here. Let me just see. Again, I'm trying to see which ones are the ones that have the most votes because um, that's what I'm trying to answer. Uh, what is the suggested etiquette of handling dealing with high conflict situations before going for Hajj and uh, with dealing with people who have wronged you? Okay, two separate questions here. As for dealing with people who have wronged you in the past, I'm assuming that is the question, um, that people have wronged you in the past, it is very healthy for the soul to forgive before going for Hajj. But I have a longer lecture online about the reality of forgiveness. It is not obligatory to forgive somebody who has done wrong to you. It's not obligatory. It's up to you. But it is therapeutic and it is good before you go for Hajj to have a clean slate. And so that's why it is encouraged to do that. As for techniques of um, dealing with high conflict situations, honestly, one of the biggest and most important aspects is to be mentally prepared. Realize you and I are going to be tested. Realize you're going to be tested by everybody around you. You're going to be tested by the most trivial things because when you're not feeling well, right? Even somebody coughing loudly next to you because they're in the same tent. You're in the same tent, right? For days, right? And so somebody coughing loudly, you know, it might even just get to you much more than it might get because you're not feeling well. Everybody's not feeling well, etc., etc. So keep your tongue in check. Allah will not punish based on an internal feeling of anger. You can be as angry as you want inside. Control the anger. Control your tongue. And calm down before you try to assess the situation. Some nuisances you can change. Others you cannot. I mean, I'm telling you from now, one of the most you know, problematic things of Hajj are the long lines at the bathrooms, right? And it's nobody talks about this. And by the way, I've given Hajj lectures online. I go into the logistical details of Hajj in ways that people don't because you need to be prepared, okay? It's very frustrating waiting 50 minutes, an hour and a half to use the bathroom. Very frustrating. You don't think you're going to get frustrated? And now somebody comes in, you think he cuts in line or he does this and that. Of course, you're going to lose your frustration. And you have the right to tell somebody, Akhi, there's a line, whatever it might be. So I'm not saying, you know, don't correct a wrong. I'm not saying don't address the nuisance. I am saying don't lose your temper. That's what I said. And that is a rule. I am saying don't become vulgar. And that is a rule. You know, during Siyam, we are supposed to control our tongue and say, if somebody's rude to us, we say, Allahumma inni sa'im. What do you think about Hajj then? If in Siyam, we're supposed to control, then how, how much more so about um, Hajj here? Um, final two, three questions, inshallah. So, could you go over how to perform Hajj on behalf of your parent? Yes, uh, very easy. Anybody, as long as you've done one Hajj, at least for yourself, you may do Hajj for any person that you feel deserves that Hajj. You're going to spend 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars. You're going to spend two, three weeks of your life. You're going to sweat. You're going to toil. You're going to get tired. That's a massive amount. Who are you going to give that to? Don't just give it to a stranger. Don't do that. It's for you. It's not, it's not just meant to be thrown away for free. But, I mean, your mother, your father, somebody that's you know moved on and owes you owe a lot to them without a doubt a parent deserves that type of you know good deed without a doubt and so for you to perform hajj on behalf of a parent is a very noble uh, endeavor 
And how do you do this? Everything is exactly the same, except one thing. Everything is exactly the same, except one. And that is, when you enter the state of Ihram, when you begin the Hajj, you say, Labbaik, on behalf of so and so. That's how you tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this Hajj is on behalf of so and so. I'm answering the call, O Allah, on behalf of my mother. Labbaik for my mother. That's, that's all. That's it. When you begin Hajj, you just change the niyyah and you say Labbaik on behalf of so and so. And then the rest of the Hajj is exactly the same. And you may make dua for yourself and you may do all the stuff you want for yourself and you may make extra dua for your mother, whoever you're doing it for. And all of the good deeds and all of that will be gifted to uh, the person that you uh, did it for. Uh, inshallah, uh, Ahmed, is that... Jazakumullah khair, Shaykh. Yes, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, inshallah, we're, we have a session in uh, four or five minutes. So, for the Sheikh Muhammad Salah as well. <laughs> so, Jazakumullah khair for the session. Uh, for those brothers and sisters that would like to stay online, or we're just going to reset the session, inshallah. If, uh, Shaykh, would you like to close it? And uh, we'll begin, inshallah, the next session. Jazakumullah khair, Subhanak. Allah Hadik Shadow Laita Sahur Kutubi Lake. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Hajj Mabrur, for Sayyid Mashkur, for Dhamb Mahfur. We ask Allah to facilitate this Hajj and to accept it from all of us. Jazakumullah khair. And for many of you, I'll be seeing you in the package. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.